Uh, well, hello, everyone. I am very excited to uh, bring on a guest that I've been wanting to talk to for a long time for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, he, he was the former CEO of Prologis, which is the largest industrial property owner in the world. Uh, as of today, they've got nearly a billion square feet of industrial property all over the world. But what what's even more inspiring to me about uh, Walt's story is that he wrote an awesome book, and, and I'm going to talk about it more later on. I'm going to pull it up here real quick. It's called Transfluence, and we're going to, uh, to talk about that more later in the show after we address the industrial market and get Walt's thoughts on it as being the former CEO of the company. But I've read that book. I've actually gone through it twice now. And the first time I went through it was the impetus for me to reach out to Walt. And he, he took over as CEO uh, in 2008. And at the time, Prologis was actually on the cusp of bankruptcy. There were a lot of analysts and pundits that were thinking that the, the company wouldn't be able to uh, service its debt, uh, it could go into bankruptcy. And Walt came in 2008 and completely turned the company around uh, to where now the, the stock, I believe, and Walt can correct me when he jumps on, but I believe the stock went as low as $2 a share. Uh, and now it's at $163 a share. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm proud to be a shareholder in that company. That's not an endorsement or recommendation for it. Do your own due diligence if you're going to explore Prologis stock. Uh, but I think you're going to be fascinated to hear from uh, Walt on on how he he actually had a career at Prolog just uh, prior to that. He was the president and the CFO and then got brought on as the CEO in 2008 and actually led the company through a massive merger uh, with AMB uh, in 2012. And like I said, turned the company completely around. So uh, Walt uh, Rakowicz, thank you so much for joining me on this uh, interview. I'm very excited to, to jump in on a number of questions with you. Great to be on with you, Chad. So I, I think that what I'd really love to start with is is getting a little bit more background on Prologis. And it, it started a number of years ago, but there was a conscious decision in 1999 to move away from some of the other asset class uh, investments that you guys owned into being strictly distribution and warehouse properties. So what was the decision some 22 years ago now to focus exclusively on industrial real estate? So... First of all, I just just I just want you to know it's a really a pleasure to be on. This is this is fun, and it's great to be talking to somebody about industrial. <laughs> I about Likewise, a lot of different things, but and and a lot of times it's just prologists in general, not necessarily about industrial property. So that that's fun. Um, so you know, we, for, first of all, I, I'd say that we we were always set up as a company with a singular focus on industrial properties. You know, we went public in uh, 1994 with that mission in mind. Um, and frankly, nobody ever really disputed that. Um, th there were really only two times that I can think of that our mission was tweaked. Um, the, the, the first was we made the decision in 1998, actually, uh, to invest in third-party refrigerated logistics um, companies, warehousing companies. Um, basically, these, this was like third-party uh, um, third, uh, party logistics companies that just focused on refrigerated logistics, okay? Mm -hmm. The thought was that perhaps we should think of ourselves broadly as a, as a logistics company and not just as an owner of distribution facilities um, because, you know, that would give us some other growth possibilities to, you know, invest in and that kind of thing. And and, and at its peak, the bis business got to be a little bit less than 10% of our balance sheet. Uh, but it was a flawed decision from the start. Um, it, you know, bought, it was less than 10% of our business and it was over 90% of our headaches. Um, <laughs> That's usually the case, eh? <laughs> it really is, man. I, you know, for, we didn't know, we didn't understand how to run a people intensive business. We weren't a people intensive business. We didn't understand unions. We had unions. Um, and we also didn't understand how negatively it would uh, be viewed by our logistics customers. Uh, you know, they, they thought of us as competitors, even if they weren't in the refrigerated segment of moving goods, you know. And, and so by tw uh, 20, 2002, just four years after we made our first investment, we sold it all and we never looked back. Um, the second time we tweaked our mission um, was when we bought a company called Catellus. Um, which was a competitor about one fourth our size at that at that time. Um, that was roughly 2004 or so. Um, 
Catellus had a retail arm. And, you know, so the retail arm came along with the acquisition, which was about, I don't know, maybe 20% of their company, something like that. So when you combined it with Prologis, it was basically 5% of Prologis. And I have to admit, there were some people in the company that said, well, maybe this gives us another growth possibility. And you know, maybe we should think about going into retail. And um, after much debate with our board, um, we really decided to run it for a little while because we had a lot of non-stable properties, development properties that needed to be stabilized and, and, but, but really not grow it. And, um, and then it took us, literally took us 10 years. But uh, so we held the, we held it for 10 years. We did pretty well with it. But then in 2011, we sold it to TPG. I should say probably seven years. Now I'm thinking about it. Um, we sold it to TPG. Um, and, and, you know, our ultimate decision to sell was because our shareholders really didn't invest in us for retail. They invested in us uh, for a pure play industrial. And that's what they wanted. And I'm really glad we, you know, we made that decision because, Quite frankly, we had plenty of opportunities in the industrial space. Once we grew globally uh, to, in essence, continue to develop um, our buildings and, you know, and, and uh, grow throughout the world. Frankly, we did not need the distraction of retail at the time. Yeah, that that's very well said, and and I want to just dig into uh, the industrial element uh, a, a bit. But b- before I get there, I I, I just want to note this is a completely live interview, and we have a live chat there as well. So if you have a question for Walt as we're going through this, feel free to uh, uh, type in there. Uh, Beverly, thanks so much for joining in, uh, uh, and Neil. Uh, thanks for joining in as well. Uh, if you want to say hello, please do. And if you have a question for Walt, uh, I'll, I'll open it up for general questions in a little bit here. But I have a, a few that I really want to get Walt's uh, insights into. But please feel free to uh, to say hello or ask a question at any point. Uh, so when when you guys decided, made the conscious effort to focus on industrial, uh, industrial has changed. And we were talking about this before the, the call, Walt. Industrial has changed so much over the last 30 years. And now everybody seems to have a little bit of familiarity with, with industrial, whether they see a, a massive distribution center off the highway it's it's a lot more commonplace and and especially with like supply chain issues at the at the dinner table everybody seems to be talking about uh industrial real estate in some form but that wasn't the case 30 years ago what, what was the decision at the time to 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 go into industrial and make that the, the core business well you know i it, 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 it's a very interesting decision it wasn't my decision um we were started by a, a gentleman by the name of bill sanders um, who came from LaSalle Partners. And um, we we liked industrial um, and we felt the market would like industrial because it was really low CapEx type properties mm-hmm. um, where investors wouldn't have to continue to put money into um, those properties over time. It was also um, a, a property type that could be consolidated when you think about it. There was no institution way back when that owned more than 1% of the entire market. Um, so it could be consolidated, um, low CapEx. It had a lot of the things that we thought um, investors uh, in public companies would be desirous of. And we felt that what we could do for the first time is if we had a if we had properties throughout the United, actually, we, were, we weren't thinking globally at the time, to be honest. So if we had properties throughout the United States and we had DHL, let's say, in you know X number of locations or Amazon didn't exist back then, but Amazon type customers in, in six or seven or eight locations, then you would think that they would have a propensity to, as they grew, um, come to us as a logistics provider that they were doing business with someplace else and um, perhaps rip up their leases in one building that they were in and develop another building for them in another building. I mean, that was the beauty of industrial because you could rip up leases, develop new buildings for somebody, and the next customer that came in didn't require a whole bunch of TI to be put in a building. And so it was really easy to expand customers throughout the United States and ultimately throughout the world um, without a tremendous amount of CapEx to be put back into the buildings. Hmm. Yeah, and we, well, really felt, and we really felt that the more buildings we had these companies in, okay, the higher propensity we would have to be a logistics partner with them and have 
conversations with them at a much higher level, uh, as opposed to just the real estate director, let's say, for example, but the logisticians in the companies and the, the people that were responsible for moving goods and, uh, and that we could become a logistics partner with them. And in fact, that is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, i.e. the more critical mass you have with a company. Um, I think when I left Prologis, we had 110 or so leases with DHL, wow. for example. And, and they were, I believe, our largest, we were certainly one of our largest customers at the time. And we were building three or four buildings for them throughout the world. Why? Because they knew us and they trusted us. And we happened to have a lease or several leases in place with them that we could, you know, flex and and help them, if you will, with their requirements. And so so I think that, you know, way back when that's how Bill thought about it, Bill Sanders, that's how the 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 founding members of Prologis thought. And in fact, it was actually brilliant and it really did work out over time. Yeah, well, and the results definitely show on on how big of a company you guys have grown to. And and that leads to the next question that I had to you is your original goal was just the US, but you've since, uh, uh, and you led this change with Prologis, it was having to be a global company. Uh, wow. The question that that I had on, on relating to that was, how did you choose the markets that you were going to enter into? And, and two part question, you, you, definitely have a focus on primary markets all over the world. What was the decision to uh, not necessarily ignore, but perhaps delay is the right word because you might enter those markets at some point down the road. But what was the decision to focus on those primary markets and not on the tertiary or secondary markets? So the overriding principle in the early years um, in selecting markets was being where our customers wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And we had to define what, who those customers were. And we define those customers as the largest 1,000 distribution companies throughout the world. And by the way, nobody had published an article that said who they were. So we, we did a tremendous amount of digging. And quite frankly, the list would change you know, every year because, again, we were the ones that were producing the list. So as we found out more about companies, we would add companies to the list. We would drop companies from the list. But we tried to define who the 1,000 largest distribution companies were. Now... Of course, you know, through acquisitions, we ended up with a lot of local and regional customers. Don't get me wrong. And we thought the world of them, um, but they weren't the ones that were going to fuel our development growth into global markets. They weren't, you know, I mean, a, a customer in Chicago that has a Chicago business is interesting. And we may do a development with for that customer in Chicago, but outside of that, we're not going to do multiple buildings for that customer. So, but the thousand largest companies, we would. And so first and foremost, I would say it was a customer driven, not real estate strategy. Um, and our customers wanted to be in the largest distribution markets. So generally those were the markets with either A, a very large population base, or B, were centrally located markets that could serve a large population base within a one day truck drive. Hmm. Okay. So markets like LA, Chicago, New York, New Jersey, Atlanta, Dallas, they were no brainers. They were the largest population bases, but markets like Indianapolis, Columbus, Memphis, Reno, they were all really good regional distribution hubs. Why? Because they sat in the center of a number of cities that were around them and that could be served within a one day truck drive. So they also became no brainers for us as well um, because our customers wanted to be there. Markets like Boston and San Diego, they were less desired. Um, not to say we couldn't make money in them and not to say that there wasn't appreciation in those markets, but they were at the end of the cul-de-sac, you know, and they didn't serve as many people. And, um, and, and, and so we generally, took the same approach when we went internationally. Um, but we had a little bit more emphasis when we went internationally on ports and, and overall movements of goods, which in Europe is, was, was really, really important. And so, um, and, and by the way, Asia it was too, in China, um, it was really, really important. Japan was important that we'd be, be near ports. Um, ports drove a lot as well. You know, they, they tend to drive um, some distribution in the United States too, particularly 
in, in New York, New Jersey, and in LA. But there are ports in, in the United States that don't necessarily drive um, huge distribution. You know, Savannah comes to mind, Charleston comes to mind. Um, stuff is blown from those ports, you know, right into the regional distribution market. So not as critical and you have to be careful with it in the United States and Europe. Um, and in Asia, those ports um, generally had large distribution centers around them. And we focused a lot on, on, on our port strategy in, internationally. So, uh, you know, that's what kind of drove our thinking. Now, today, I have to tell you, I'm not as familiar with the Prologis strategy. Um, I think there's certainly more to think about today as it relates to e-commerce, um, last mile distribution. Um, that was not necessarily driving our decisions way back when. I think they, they are now. Mm -hmm. um, and local distribution is much more in demand today um, than it was you know, way back when. And so the strategy might be different today. I'm probably not the best person to speak to that, but that's, that's what sort of drove our thinking way back when. I, I love the point you brought up about the making a list of your largest companies that were the big distributors, uh, because yeah. that's I, I think that's actually a big strength that Prologis uh, still has, and it was it was developed on that foundation of you guys creating research that wasn't previously there. And I still actually use Prologis research on a regular basis. So yeah, anyone that's uh, watching or listening, uh, I, I think that actually go on to Prologis's website, whether you're an investor or not, you will gain access to a considerable amount of market information just by the the amount of time and effort that they're putting into creating reports. So I'd encourage you just to go check out Prologis's website. And that was clearly built on the foundation of you guys recognizing that there is a need for this information and it wasn't being produced. So you just went out and, and did it. So I, I commend you guys for, for doing that. Maybe I'll switch gears on that topic because I want to get your thoughts on when you took over as CEO in, in 2008. And, and as I mentioned at the at the beginning of the show, uh, it was stock was in turmoil. A lot of analysts were saying uh, that there is there's panic. Uh, there, the company could uh, be uh, disrupted. So you took over at a, a probably a very difficult time uh, to do it. But you had to make a lot of hard decisions. And and I want to get into some of the leadership uh decisions and challenges that you made in, in a bit here. But but the first thing I wanted to address was the properties that you sold. And that was, mm -hmm. I'm sure that was just to shore up your the, the balance sheet and get some yeah. of the debt off the table. How did you decide what properties in the portfolio you would sell and then which ones by extension that you'd keep? Yeah. So let me tell you the story a little bit um, on that. That's a really great question. So when I took over in November of 2008, our stock, as you mentioned, had reached an all-time low of $2 and 20 cents a share. Um, it, it, we we're on the verge of bankruptcy. Wall Street Journal had just done an article on the front page, basically saying that we were, you know, intimating that we were next. And um, we knew that one of the first things we had to do was create liquidity and pay down debt. And that that would drive our stock price longer term as, as, as opposed to earnings and, and the like. So, you know, we couldn't raise equity the refinancing markets were basically closed, non-existent to us at least, not existent to most people, but especially us. And so our only option was to sell properties. Um, so early on in the recession, um, we really couldn't sell properties in the United States because there was very little capital, number one, and most buyers were on the sidelines trying to figure out where the mark was gonna be. You know, like how, how, you know, what, how high are the cap rates going to go or, you know, how low or how, how well are we going to be able to buy these properties relative to replacement costs, blah, blah, blah. There just really wasn't a lot in the U.S., but China was still really strong. Um, and we were approached by the government of Singapore as they were interested in buying our entire China portfolio and they smelled blood. Hmm. And, um, and, that, and our investment there was worth about a billion dollars um, at that time. And I would add that we did not have a lot of appetite for continued investment in China at that time because we had no capital. <laughs> okay, And uh, so our appetite was really low to continue to invest there. And so we thought this probably would be a good time to sell if we could get the right price. Uh, Government of Singapore was also our partner in Japan. And... Uh, to be candid, they were worried about our financial condition and they didn't want to be partners with somebody 
Um, we were we were 20, they were 80. They didn't want to be partners with somebody who could go bankrupt. And so, but but interestingly enough, we both had leverage because they wanted China, but they didn't want us to take it to the market. And they knew if we took it to the market, you know, it, we may get a different, you know, so that kind of kept them a little bit honest. And and also we were 20% partner and we could easily say, no, we didn't want to sell Japan unless we got the right price for our 20%. So, uh, you know, we had leverage, even though we needed cash, we had some leverage. And so uh, we were able to craft an agreement at the end of the day at a reasonable price for us, which is about a billion and a half dollars to sell China and our 20% interest. And we gained, they gained what they wanted. We gained, you know, desperately needed cash to pay down debt, which helped boost our stock from 220 to like three or four or five dollars a share, which was by the way, a huge move at the time. And then the other thing that happened is, you know, the, those of your listeners may be familiar, Prologis has um, funds throughout the world. And we had an agreement with all of our funds in place where we would develop properties. And as soon as they got stabilized to 90% or greater, we would appraise them and then we would sell them into our funds at appraised value. Well, the good news for us was that appraisals had not yet reflected any lower values. And we had about a billion dollars of stabilized properties that, that had been you know, stabilized before the fall. And so we sold that billion dollars into funds in Europe and Asia and in the United States. And so the first roughly two and a half billion dollars of sales were earmarked in those agreements, either to government of Singapore, as I mentioned, or, or to funds. So that was great. That created the, some liquidity to sort of get us started. But that, and then after that, um, we began to, you know, we began to stabilize the company and then the markets began to stabilize. Um, so we made some sales, quite frankly, at high cap rates. I, I'll be honest with you. We, you know, we made some sales that we, we wished we could have another year or two and stabilize cap rates. But, but I would say in general, um, we looked at future sales as an opportunity to get rid of assets that were either older or, you know, had function, functional issues that we got through acquisitions that we didn't like, um, or just didn't have the, you know, weren't in the right locations. You know, we looked at sub markets and say, we said, what sub markets do we really want to be in? Do we want to be in three or four in the city or one or two? Um, and we got, so we got rid of properties that probably the market didn't think were the most fabulous either. And so they were not low cap rate properties on a relative basis at the time. Um, and so we suffered earnings dilution, but you know what? Our stock wasn't trading on earnings. It was trading on the basis of paying down debt. Hmm. And, um, and so any sales were important back then. Um, and our stock began to move up because we were just simply paying down debt. And so we actually looked at it as an opportunity to sell dogs and cats, relatively speaking. I mean, there are good industrial buildings. Don't get me wrong. We didn't own any real crap, honestly. But but we, we owned some buildings that we just didn't on a relative basis like. And we looked at ourselves and we said, hey, there's no better time to sell the stuff that we really don't want long term. It's not going to, the dilution is not going to drive our stock price. Paying down debt is. So we really got rid of three or four billion dollars at that point in time of, of just sort of what we would consider functionally less um, good assets and locations not so good. And in the end, we ended up selling 20% of our global asset base. Um, but we made our growth profile as a company much stronger coming out of the recession. And that was actually the most important thing. Yeah. And it certainly has reflected itself just in, in how the company turned itself around and, and positioned to where it is today. It, as you were mentioning that, it, it led me to another question that I had for you is, is just how you kept on top of all the different markets uh, that you guys were looking at and then just in industrial real estate in general like we were talking earlier about how uh ceiling heights 30 years ago were 20 foot 24 foot clear and that seemed crazy uh right. now we're seeing much higher than that but how how did in your position as as this 
CEO and even before that, when you were the president and CFO and, and prior positions that you had, how did you keep on top of the industrial real estate market and just how it changed uh, on, on like a bigger picture? And then as well, just identifying all the trends and market characteristics of the individual markets. Yeah, I, I, I would say, first, let me just say that, you know, I was fortunate to have worked 10 years at Trammell Crow Company as a leasing agent and then a partner before Prologis. And so, and and by the way, when I was at Trammell Crow Company, I spent 100% of my time on industrial. I mean, we built some um, flex sort of service center properties and and this was, and, and my entire time at Trammell Crow Company, I was at the ports of Long Beach in LA. So um, really in one of the most dynamic markets, and then I was in the city of commerce for a little while as well. And so really dynamic markets in Southern California. So I cut my teeth with one of the best companies in the world at the time. And I cut my teeth in industrial. And I say that because I think having a background in it really helped me when I became chief financial officer, then president, and then CEO. But every day I was in the trenches for my first 10 years, focused on leasing and property management and construction management, financing, acquisitions, developments and the like, right? Um, so then when I joined Prologis, I, I ran the Mid-Atlantic, what we called the Mid-Atlantic region. I moved from LA to uh, the Midwest in the United States and I ran that region for five years, really doing the same thing. The only thing in addition that I did then is hired all of our people. Um, we were a really small company when I joined Prologis. So I hired a lot of the people in the Midwest and, and then sort of taught them to do the, the same thing. But really, I was focused on industrial then for 10 years at Trammell Crow, five years as a regional person um, at, at Prologis, and then ultimately became the chief financial officer. So, and then CEO. So as CEO on one hand, as you say, Chad, you know, you are one step removed from the day-to-day -day information, no question. Perhaps two or three steps, I don't know. But anyway, you're, you're, you're at least one step removed. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, you got people on the ground in every market, um, and it's possible to get a general sense of the market simply by keeping in touch with your people. And that's the most important thing as a CEO is you got to just keep in touch with, your, you know, keeping in touch with your people. And I was also constantly on the road visiting our people. And when I visited them, I, I wanted to go on property tours. You know, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to see our properties. I want to see our competitors' properties. And and so it was really relatively easy for me to keep abreast of market conditions at a high level. And also, you know, Prologis is doing a lot of investment. I mean, we probably did five to 10 investment memos every week. Um, so Sundays were my day to spend four or five, three or four or five hours literally reading through all of our investment memos because Monday was our investment day. Um, and you know, in every one of those memos, there's market information and, you know, you can, you can pretty much stay abreast of what's going on in each market. When you have to do a development in a market and you got to approve it as a senior manager, you better know what's going on in the market and ask enough questions. And so uh, I think my background helped me easily digest it. I think the property tours that I did and, and reaching out to our people helped me. I think our investment mem memos helped me. And so, you know, when I met with, um, people on Wall Street and talk to them about the company, I, I think I always had a pretty good grasp on what was going on. Um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't there every day in the market, um, but I think I knew enough to be dangerous and that's probably all that counted at the time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well said. How let's, let's just touch on that one uh, comment from earlier about the the ceiling heights increasing so much. What what have you seen change in industrial real estate over the last uh, thirty years or so? Oh my gosh, geez. I think the um, yeah. I mean, when we <laughs> back when I started building buildings in nineteen eighty five, um, you know, to have a hundred foot truck court was big. Hmm. You know, to have a uh, twenty four foot clear building with um, ESFR sprinkler, you know, not ESFR, but um, 0.4 over a thousand sprinkler system was like, that was like, you know, the cat's meow. I mean, this is a, an unbelievable building, right? Um, so obviously, you know, you wouldn't build a, you certainly wouldn't build a big building that would be 24 foot clear today. And, you know, a hundred foot truck yard, then went to 110, then went to 120, then 130. And now, you know, God only knows what, we're, what people are building today because you need a lot more trucking room, you know. 
So functionally, the buildings have changed. Um, yeah. Although last mile buildings, you know, you can't, you know, you can't replace the fact that you're not going to wreck the buildings. You know, you're not going to buy buildings for land value. So, you know, you got to make them work. Um, and people do make them work, but that's not the way you would build a building today, obviously. Um, the other big thing I think that's changed is the um, it, the institutional nature of the, the business is, is just so much different. I mean, um, you know, it, back then you could, you could assemble um, uh, a number of high net worth um, individuals together and, you know, put together some debt and buy a portfolio. And maybe there was one or two other buyers that were, were chasing after it. Um, but, and, you know, that, and that's, but that was your, you know, your competition. There wasn't 20 people making offers on a portfolio of properties, you know, or 40 people, whatever, whatever it is today. There's just a lot more capital out there today. Um, and, you know, debt is, is more available and, and, um, and so that's changed considerably, and I think has made it much more difficult to buy assets um, than it was way back when. And also way back when you only needed about 5% equity. Um, you know, I mean, if you put up 5% equity to buy a portfolio, you could find a bank to finance 95, 90 to 95% of the, of, the, of the capital. Now it takes a lot more equity to do that. And, and literally you could actually build a development with 5% equity way back when. Wow. And, and then finance out of that equity. Um, if, if you created 10 to 20% margins in your development, you could stabilize it, finance out of all your equity. And then, and, you know, and literally all, all you needed to do was to, to find debt in essence and, and, and pay off all your equity partners. So, I mean, the world is just, it's, it requires a lot more equity today. It's more institutionalized, it's much more competitive um and uh the, and the buildings are far different than they were back then so it's a it is a it's it's a completely different business today than it was back then but it's yeah, still, still low capex which is awesome yeah. um and uh, you know it's it's still you can you can grow a business throughout uh several cities and have several customers in in a number of different locations and you know a lot of the dynamics associated with why we wanted people to invest it in, in the first place are still alive and well. Yeah. And, and if anything, now it's on a lot more people's radar that, that oh, this yeah. is an investment vehicle and, and that has led to a lot more of those institutionalized investors chasing yeah. assets. Uh, they they seem to be a lot more comfortable with low cap rates than, than some of like the private guys who, who are chasing higher cap rates. So you're right. It's, it's just becoming much more competitive on that and it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next 30 years uh how much it, it continues to change but it, it is definitely a fascinating industry to be in right now uh, and, I, and I wanted to and i would add one more thing let me just add one more thing to that you're speaking of cap rates um there was a disconnect probably a 100 to 200 basis point disconnect between industrial buildings and office buildings which i never understood meaning that Office buildings actually actually traded at lower cap rates way back in the 80s. Um, well, I should say well-placed, good office buildings. I don't want to say this the wrong way, but, uh, you know, an, an institutional quality office building was a lower cap rate, more sexy um, than an industrial building back then, which always, you know, we always scratched our heads and said, what? I mean, I'd much rather own an, a warehouse with, you know, very little capex, very little ongoing maintenance. You know, CPI increases every year. And then I would an office building where, when a company leaves, I got to put all this TI back in and blah blah blah. So there was a disconnect, and I think it was because people didn't understand industrial. They didn't see it as sexy. It was just not a product type that people knew much about, and it took longer to institutionalize the property way back when. The property type, I should say, way back when. Now it's completely different. Yeah, it's, it's a reversal. Yeah. Uh, like People might have looked at an office building 20 years ago as a trophy asset, but I can't imagine there's many B or C class office owners that are considering that asset a trophy asset right yeah. now. Uh, so yeah, you're right. I, I have seen that reversal as well, where it's, it's the opposite now. Now office is probably trading at 150, 200 basis points higher than an industrial one. Well, so yeah, that's, it's a very fascinating observation on how quickly in the grand scheme of things that that actually turned over. Yeah. Uh, 
I want to go to uh, when go back to the 2008 when you took over and and you sold those the, uh, sold the portfolio in China. You sold the 20 percent interest in Japan. That was one element of what you had to do as a CEO to course correct the company. How did you, how how else did you manage that change from just a leadership standpoint? Yeah. So um, you mentioned this, but just to put things into perspective, before I took over in 2008, the stock had dropped. 95 percent in the first 10 months of that year okay wow. so in january uh the stock was at 72 to 75 dollars a share something like that um and I, I won't go into that story um but in detail but i decided that i wanted to leave the company when the stock was at an all-time high I, now i had no idea that things would get as bad as they would in the next 10 months, but I decided to leave the company and formally resigned in January of 2008, mainly because of a fallout that I had had with the, uh, with the CEO of the company at the time. Um, and again, I won't go into that detail, but I just didn't feel like the company was heading down the right path. This is probably mm -hmm. the best way of saying it. So anyway, 10 months later, after I had left, um, it, um, the stock had dropped from 70, two to 75 ish to $2 and 20 cents a share by beginning of November. And over that 10 month period of time, it was the third worst performing stock in the S and P 500 behind mm -hmm. general growth properties, who was later to go bankrupt and behind AIG, who was later to be taken over by the federal government government. So we were in dire straits. So when I took over, I inherited a culture of what I, if I, I'd just be, brutally honest. I mean, I think it was a culture of fear and in some respects, a culture of dysfunction um, throughout the organization. Um, that's what happens when your stock falls 95%. You know, people are deer in the headlights all day long. Like what just happened, you know? Um, and so the company had been blindsided by the markets and, um, and I think it was exacerbated quite frankly, by management arrogance, both internally and externally. Um, and again, I won't go into the details on that, but you know, when I, I was called by the board and the board said, we're going to move on with the existing CEO, we'd like you to come back and run the company. And, um, that was a tough decision. I'll be honest. I, I didn't know if the company was going to go bankrupt, but I knew I wouldn't want to be the CEO of the company that was going to go bankrupt. <laughs> so I struggled with it. Um, but I did end up coming, coming back. And when I came back, I knew that a change was desperately needed. Um, I think we had, we, you know, we had to move the company from a company that had a culture of insecurity and arrogance um, in some respects to a culture of trust where our employees and our board and our shareholders, everybody needed to trust the management team again. And I think that trust was gone. And, you know, that meant we needed to make every decision and quite frankly, treat everyone in the company with openness and transparency. And I felt like that was lost or that had gotten lost over the course of the last few years. And, um, and not only our employees, I mean, our shareholders, we had to treat with openness and transparency, our board, our customers, um, really all the stakeholders in the company. Um, you know, I think many leaders say that they're transparent, but truly being transparent is tough. And, I think it takes leadership or leaders that are willing to show humility um, in the face of adversity. Um, they're willing to be brutally honest um, when market pressures force you to do something different than that. Um, it's tough to be honest at all times. It's tough to walk into a room when you know there's an elephant in the room and you don't want to deal with it as a leader. Um, and I think leaders that are willing to show humanity um, when the market pressures also face you to do um, otherwise. And, and so it's really, you know, it was really, it's really kind of hard for me to say, well, these are the three things that we did to change the culture. You know, that's actually a bunch of baloney. Those that will tell you that I think it takes work, it takes intentionality and it's best translated in real life examples. Um, and it has a lot to do with how you treat people. Um, and, and how transparent you're willing to be with people and, and, and being transparent 
and opening your up yourself up um, as a leadership team, which we tried to do, you build trust with your people. Um, and when you build trust, then you get people to do things that they wouldn't do otherwise um, and, and just work their butts off to, to make things um, happen. And, and, you know, it took three years to really turn the company around, quite frankly. And, but we did it because we had a lot of energized and fat, just fabulous employees that, that became totally energized to make it work and, and make it happen. And um, so I wrote this book that you just talked about. It's called Transfluence, um, came out last year. And in the book, I talk about a lot of the examples that we used in turning around the company. And um, I think you'll get a better idea of those examples and some of the things that we did if you read the book. Uh, you have read the book. Um, I've read it twice. Yep. Yeah, so everybody on here, um, if you get a chance to read the book, I think you'll, you'll get a sense as to what I mean by building trust in the organization. And I do talk a lot about the value of being humble as a leader. I talk about the value of being brutally honest as a leader. And I talk about the value of being a human being as a leader. Things that I believe people respond to. Yeah, I, I love the book. I, I think it's it's fantastic. I'm going to try and uh, recite one story that you told in there from from memory. So bear with me if I yeah. mess up a name or something. But as, as I'm going to try and uh, remember this story, uh, I'll, I'll also open it up for uh, for general questions for Walt as well. So as I'm rambling on here, uh, feel free to ask a question. We'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can. But the story was about a nine-year-old boy who is playing in his basement. He was playing with some fire and he accidentally lit a gas can or some kind of flammable object on fire. And it ended up burning his body to the extent that the hospital that he ultimately ended up going to thought he had a, a very, very low probability of, of surviving. It was it was that bad. He was young, wasn't able to, to, to fight it off as well as they thought that he'd be able to. So they thought he was going to pass away. And as it turned out, there was a, a famous broadcaster, and I believe he was from St. Louis. I think he it broadcasted is. for the Cardinals games. Yeah. And uh, uh, his name was Jack Buck, and world famous broadcaster. His, his son, actually, Joe Buck, if people might be familiar with now, uh, is kind of taking over. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he he ended up coming by. He heard it through through the just the community in St. Louis that that this had happened to this boy. So he popped by just to say something to him, and it was something to the effect that, uh, "Wake up, kid! Uh, you're gonna you're gonna make it through this. Keep fighting." And he left, and I think he like just broke down and cried. Like he was just he's like, "This is so tragic. I got to do something more than just coming by for for one visit." So he started going by more often and he kept going by and he kept going by and, and I think he went the majority of the time uh that he was able to that he wasn't working and I think he had sent some other baseball players and he had sent some people uh to just inspire this kid and the kid pulled through on it but tragically he lost all of his fingers uh, so he had to have all his fingers amputated and what Jack did is he sent him a baseball it was a signed baseball I, I don't know if it was Ozzy Smith I seem to recall that yeah and he said uh I'll send you another autograph ball if you can write thank you for the thank you for the ball on here. And the the kid had no fingers. So you could appreciate how difficult it would be to actually write on there. But he figured out how to do it, how to grip a pencil, or grip a pen, and he wrote, wrote it on there. And Jack then continued to I think he sent him over 60 baseballs, if if I'm not mistaken. 60 baseballs. Right. 60 baseballs. And then it it uh What's even crazier about the story? So this kid was nine years old at the time when that happened. Uh, at, the kid learned how to write, just not not just from Jack. I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot of physiotherapists and people involved in helping him get to there. But uh, Jack was certainly a huge source of inspiration. When uh, the kid John O'Leary, when he uh, graduated, uh, Jack gave him his crystal baseball that he had gotten from from it was the Hall of Fame. Is that that the baseball that he got from it? So he That's gave right. him like this priceless uh trophy uh, that he had got uh crystal baseball for when he graduated and john's still uh, still going I, I looked into his story a little bit the other day he's a motivational speaker uh he's he's uh does podcasts he's written books he's just like a phenomenal human being but it was it was jack that showed that humility so i i was just i was so impressed by that story i read it twice i hope i did it justice by trying to restrain my memory oh, gosh i couldn't even explain it that well let me tell you, I, I wrote that in the chapter about purpose also. 
Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right about the word humility. But I, I, I really believed that if we could bring, you know, when I, when I rejoined the company, I, I, I got the sense in walking around the hallways that we had this woe is me attitude. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like, wow, I mean, are we going to go bankrupt? And, and I really felt like if we could bring a sense of purpose back to our organization um, and instill that purpose, broader purpose in people's minds, you know, that we could all of a sudden see the purpose in the things that we did every day. And we would want to come to work and we'd want to turn around the company. And so we actually doubled down on, on um, what, what I call purpose. These days you might call the S in ESG social. <laughs> but we, we doubled down in all the cities throughout the world. I said, we've got to pick something, anything, whatever it is that's important to you to give back um, in our communities and make sure that every single employee does it and, um, is, and is energized by it. And so we can't, we're not gonna tell you at headquarters what to do. I'm not gonna tell the people in Japan what to do. I'm not gonna tell the people in, in Paris what to do. You guys pick what you wanna do. And some people throughout the world actually struggled with that because um, depending on where you are, it, it, there are some very high tax regions in Europe where they think that it's all up to the government to do it, not for people to do those things, you know? Um, and uh, so culturally, it was a little odd for some people, but, but at the end of the day, we had a company that was working to do things outside of where they were, um, uh, you know, in their communities, but outside themselves. And, and you realize that the more you give, the more you get. Um, and so we... So John was a perfect example. John O'Leary in that story is a perfect example of purpose and and how you know uh, it changed Jack Buck's life to be able to you know change John O'Leary's life. I think you know I think it changed our employees' lives to give back to other people's lives, and I think it changed the trajectory of the company when we did that. Well, it, it it's clear that not only were you the 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 right person to turn prologis around, but I'm sure that people uh, listening to this as well would just see that like the the human element of you, not not the business side, not the fact that you were have a Harvard uh, an MBA from Harvard and you had all this uh, real world experience. Just the the person that you are was the right person for that. So I commend you for that. Uh, we did have a question from Drew pop up. Uh, Hi, Walt. Could you provide an example? of the real world stories of leadership you and your team rallied around when you were trying to change the culture. Yeah, I could tell you one that um, we weren't, this, this was not a story that um, I purposefully did to change the culture, but it is something that became folklore throughout the organization, Drew. And it's in the book. Um, so if you read the book, you'll, you'll get it, you know, the second time, but I'll tell it anyway, because it was really impactful. Um, I was, you know, sort of, I think I was there maybe a month and a half into my tenure um, coming back. This was just prior to Christmas in 2008. And um, we were, I mean, we were really struggling. We had, we, we had an all night um, meeting and it was probably one o'clock in the morning with all the financial people in the organization. There was probably 15 people sitting around the room and um Somebody said to me, um, I can't remember, it was a CFO or, or one of the people, uh, finance people in the organization said, uh, well, well we, 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 we got some problems. We're, we're probably going, and I go, well, what's, what, what do you mean we got problems? Well, we're probably going to blow our bond covenants to the tune of six to $10 billion in the month of January because we don't have the earnings to support it. And I said, well, what does that mean? And um, everybody looks at each other in the room and they say, well, probably means we're going to have to file for bankruptcy in the month of January. And now this is a company I had been with for 15 years, left, come back. I didn't come back to file for bankruptcy, and, but it was the first time I really heard the B word, you know? And um, I, I mean, I turned white as a ghost, absolutely white as a ghost. And I didn't know what to say, you know? And um, so I said, looked around people and said, look, you guys mind if I just leave the room and I just need to catch my, catch a breath of fresh air. And he said, no, that's fine. Walt, go ahead. So I left, I walked down the hallway 
started to faint. And next thing you know, I'm looking at this chair and I'm thinking if I get to the chair, I can sit down. Well, I missed the chair and my head hits the corner of the desk and splits open. Um, and I'm laying down on the, on the carpet and stark outside. And it turns out I was laying down for about 10 minutes and you know, my head's, you know, br- you know, cut and I wake up and I first, like for 30 seconds, I have no idea where I am. Absolutely no idea. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Oh my gosh, my head is killing me. And I felt like this and you could see blood and blood in the carpet. And I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, there, everybody's still in the room waiting for me to come back. So I run into the bathroom, try to, you know, stop the bleeding and then walk back in the room. And, um, everybody's looking at me and I go, okay, let's talk about this bankruptcy thing. And, and my CFO looks at me and goes, no, Walt, let's talk about that God awful lump on your head. How did that happen? And I realized, you know, in leadership, you think you're hired, you know, you think you're hired into a job as, C- as a CEO, cause you're, you're going to have all the answers. Well, guess what? You realize you don't have all the answers. It's your job to marshal people together who have all the answers. And the more you allow them to see that, the more vulnerable maybe sometimes that you are as a leader, actually sometimes the more powerful it really is. There's power and vulnerability at the right time. And I began to realize that the more credit I gave to people and less I gave to myself, and the more vulnerable I was in front of people, Um, even sometimes making fun of myself from time to time, self-deprecating comments and those sorts of things, the more powerful I became. And yeah, that's what I'm talking about in terms of stories that build culture, because I didn't tell everybody to walk out of that room and tell everybody in the company, but somehow a lot of people in the company within one week knew what happened. Okay. But you know what? It didn't hurt me as a leader. It actually helped me as a leader. So, yeah, when I think about stories, that's the kind of story that are culture building moments that aren't intentionally culture, culture build, building moments. Like you wouldn't want to repeat them again. I wouldn't want to fall <laughs> in my head, right? But actually, in some respects, garnered the troops together in a more powerful way because we all felt like we were together. And it wasn't me versus them. It was a CEO that was willing to be open, honest, vulnerable at times, transparent, but told it like it was. Yeah, I, I love that point because you're right. And especially in, in the corporate world, there seems to be this stigma against being vulnerable. You get yeah. that uh, that image of a CEO who's supposed to be all powerful and almighty, and he doesn't want to admit that he's made a mistake. And you see that transcend all the way down from a CEO of a Fortune 500 company all the way down to uh, a president of a small company who refuses to admit that he's made a mistake or he refuses to be vulnerable. And it doesn't create a culture of, of collaboration about people all going in the same direction. It, it creates that divide of that me versus them. So I I, I really enjoy it. I'm glad you made that point about that. That's, that's, that was, that was, and I when I read that story too, I was like, I can't even imagine uh, everyone sitting around the boardroom table being like, well, where's, where's Walt? <laughs> little do they know you're you're uh, passed out from hitting your head on a table uh that, i can't even imagine that everyone's just waiting around and they're new ceo and they're trying to figure out where what's going on that would have been uh would have been fascinating uh oh one more question just came in from neil uh yeah. walt how did you start working in industrial real estate and yeah. for new investors how would you recommend someone begins learning about industrial real estate books articles videos question mark thanks well, there were no books, articles, videos, all that stuff way back when. And um, I can just tell you, sometimes things happen by hook or crook. You know, you just don't have any control over it necessarily. But I graduated from business school in 1985. And I, um, uh, I Trammell Crow was the only company that um, interviewed, real estate company that interviewed on campus that I can remember. Maybe there was one or two others. And um, I wanted to work. I was from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I wanted to work in LA because I feel, felt like in real estate, LA was a large market and it was, I was single. I felt like I could meet ladies there and I just thought it'd be a fun place to live, you know? <laughs> um, so 
So anyway, literally, um, I said, I took the Trammell Coast company said to me, well, where do you want to work? And I said, L.A. They said, OK, well, we'll we'll contact the partner out there. We like you. So they contacted the partner. Partner said, yeah, um, I was going to school in Boston at the time. So they said, yeah, um, you know, we'll, we'll hire him, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, I go out there. And of course, you know, I'm, I graduated from business school. I'm thinking, well, I'm going to be in, in real estate. I'm going to do something, you know, like an office buildings, or I'm going to do retail centers or hotels or, and, you know, naive, I didn't even do my, my research on what Trammell Crow's business was in Southern California, <laughs> but 90% of their business in Southern California, or maybe 80, but it was a large percentage of it was industrial. OK, it happened to be industrial because 40 percent of all shipments come through the ports of L.A. and Long Beach. Stupid me. So anyway, <laughs> I sit down with the partner first day and he goes, yeah, well, I want you to work in industrial. I'm like, industrial. Like, what's that? He goes, he goes, well, that happens to be about like 80 percent of our business. Everybody, almost everybody works in industrial. I'm like, oh, OK. I mean, to show you how stupid and naive I was, you know, and I, I go, OK, well, that sounds good. Well. After three months in the business, I loved it. And the, why? I loved it because it wasn't sexy. All the things I wanted, it wasn't. But it wasn't sexy. The brokers were fabulous. They were people I could have beers with every night with, you know. And um, the customers, the people that were touring the properties, you know, came in jeans. And they were, you know, they, you know, they, 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 they were, I mean, they were just normal people. They were great people, people that I felt like, you know, I, I had grown up in Pittsburgh. My, my parents didn't have a lot of money and I had never really did anything sexy, frankly, growing up anyway. So why did I need to be that way? Right. And, and I, frankly, it was a good lesson for me because I thought too much of myself back then. Mm -hmm. And, and in fact, I actually fit really, really well in with the people, the customers, the brokers and everybody in the industrial business. I just loved it. And after about three months, I was like, wow, I wouldn't want to be any other place. And wouldn't I, you know, how would I ever know that I'd spend the next 30 years in that business? But that's what I did. I just loved it that much. So sometimes you just never know how or why you're going to make a decision. Sometimes you just do it by hook or crook, or sometimes you don't even control it. But in my case, I didn't, but I'm really, really blessed and fortunate that that decision was made for me. I, I have the exact same uh, story on that is uh, when I got into the business, I thought the exact same thing. I thought I'd be working in office buildings or retail. And I that that's just all I knew about commercial real estate. And the office that I joined has a heavy concentration in industrial as well. And I was like, I don't even know what industrial is, but sure. Sounds like, sounds fun. Let's give it a try. And I, I have the exact same sentiment. I'm so fortunate to have found my way into that because it's been such an awesome career, not just as a broker, but to, to invest in along the way. I, I, I love it. So I, I share the exact same uh, story with you on going from not knowing what industrial real estate was to being so fortunate to have having been in there. Uh, second part, and, and maybe we'll, oh, uh, are you kicking us off wide or is it interview over? Can I, uh -oh, you're, I, think you're, I think you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. You okay. Can keep... uh, Okay, uh, just uh, perhaps the last question uh, before we wrap up, Walt, was the second part of uh, of Neil's question is if, if you were a uh, new into real estate or, or trying to get into industrial real estate, what would you recommend for someone to not not necessarily accelerate the learning curve, but just what like what resources? How, how does somebody get into it without having to spend a, a career and a lifetime learning it? You know, that's a really great question. I'm not sure. Neil, I'm not sure I'm prepared to even answer that today because it, it's it's just changed over the years. But my son graduated six years ago from um, undergraduate school, and I told him I thought he should become a broker for X number of years because I truly believe that the people that understand the business the best are the people that are knocking their heads against the wall every day, representing customers and really getting a sense for what customers want and desire and having to sell that. I think they become better developers. I think they become better investors if they under, understand that. Now, you know, it's not easy to, and he, by the way, he did that for the first four years with Jones Lang with Sal. And then he took a job in banking with Wells Fargo for the next two years. That's where he is today, just running numbers and, you know, underwriting loans and that kind of thing. So I think, 
you know, it's hard to say, where do you enter in? How do you learn the business? I think you learn it by, by actually getting into the business and just doing it, you know, doing as much as it, of, of it as you can, um, either with a team of individuals. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in uh, even if you don't stay in it, being in the brokerage business, because I think they really understand the market the best. And I think the better you understand markets um, or a market, um, the better you can translate the business in a broader sense, um, it, whether it be um, acquisitions, development, you know, construction or whatever you do. I, I think that's the best way to understand the business. But, but you don't pick that up in a book. <laughs> um, you know, you pick it up by going out and doing it. Yeah, well said. Well, I'll, I'll wrap up with that. I, I really do appreciate your time on that. Well, I, I got a ton of insight listening to you, Chad, and we're getting a few comments in there. Uh, Beverly, thanks for joining in. Uh, Shami, I missed your comment earlier. Thanks for, for joining in the comment as well. Uh, as you guys have, have heard, I'm a big fan of that book, having read it twice. So uh, I'll, I'll try to leave a link if or if why if one of us can put that in there after so you can go in and purchase it i, I highly recommend it I'll, I'll read it a third time uh sometime in 2022 so uh thanks uh for that walt uh, what, what's the best way people can get in touch with you if they wanted to uh, just follow along with what you're doing or learn more yeah so i have a website and it's i'll spell my name for you well you can see it i guess right there but it's a uh, walt um the website's been up for well, i don't know three four years now we we blog on a weekly basis, um, uh, at Twitter, you can follow me at, at Walt Rakowicz, uh, linked. I'm on LinkedIn at Walter Rakowicz. And you can also get a copy of my newsletter, um, at www.waltrakowicz.com slash newsletter. And so, and you pick up a lot of this stuff. Oh, it's art. Whoever just posted K, that K instead of a C there, not a C. Yeah, so I think he probably there. noticed that. I think he's retyping it. <laughs> yeah, maybe retyping it in. Um, so lots of ways to get a hold of me. Um, we, Like I said, we blog on a weekly basis on all kinds of good stuff. Not necessarily industrial real estate, but um, but all kinds of le mostly leadership stuff. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. And I got as much value from the leadership stories you told as the talking about your experience in Prologis. So yeah, I'd encourage people to check out the website. And since uh, Beverly was uh, on here as well, I'd be remiss to, to not give a bit of a shameless plug. Uh, please consider subscribing if you haven't uh, and like this video. And if you're watching this uh, when it wasn't live, I'd greatly appreciate if you could leave a comment as well. Uh, but thanks to everybody for watching. I really do appreciate your time. And mostly, Walt, thank you once again. I, I greatly value the time you spent talking with me. My pleasure, Chad. My pleasure. Everybody have a great weekend and have awesome holidays. Likewise. Merry Christmas.